Chris Collins here, and I hope everybody's having a happy holiday season. We are busy creating some new content and recording some new episodes of Unleashed that you will see early in January. But in the meantime, I picked some of my favorite episodes from last year, and this one is Steve Sims from Bluefish. Now, we've condensed this into one. It was originally released as a two-parter, so this is the unabridged version, and I would encourage you to get a pen and paper and take some notes. Steve is a genius at marketing, at finding a niche, and the thing I think I've learned from Steve more than anything is his mindset. When others don't believe something is possible, he figures out a way and he has a certain pattern of thinking. So really pay attention to that when you're listening to this. There's a lot of gold in this episode. I've listened to it a couple times myself just to refresh because he's such an inspiration. And make sure you get his new book out also. And so here it is, Steve Sims. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! I can't read it. There's no, there's no words on it. That's tomorrow, and that is it for us today. And we will leave you with a... I can't do it. We'll do it live. Okay. We'll, no. we'll do it live! Welcome, everybody, to Unleashed. How are you doing, G-Man? I'm doing good. <laughs> well, we have a special guest today. Steve, how are you? I'm oh, feeling good, feeling good. A good friend that lives very close here up in the Hollywood Hills, right? Yep, yep. What's it feel like coming downtown? Well, you know, I cut past passport control, but they let me in. I'm like, <laughs> we got to be checking things better. Yeah, the visa. <laughs> They're getting light. <laughs> they need to put Trump in charge of that. <laughs> what did he, uh, didn't he just like... Make it illegal for most countries to come here. <laughs> yeah, no one's allowed to come here anymore. You know, I can't leave because I'll never get back in. <laughs> so funny. So we, um, we're we excited about this. We're going to try to keep this under four hours because you have so many good stories. <laughs> <laughs> but your your company's Bluefish, and you, you basically is the motto, you make the impossible happen. Is that how you say it? Yeah, yeah. We did, a, we did an article in Forbes, and they came up and said that we were the real-life Wizard of Oz for, the, for those with a checkbook. So I quite like that. That is. That's <laughs> yeah, great. I'm kidding. Yeah. That's a good tagline. Mm-hmm. And um, so just most, well, let's let's go way back. How did you come up with the idea that there was a, a niche for that? Oh, I didn't. Um, I was a doorman of a brothel in Hong Kong. And uh, quite simply, I wanted to not be a doorman anymore. So the people that were coming into the clubs and stuff, I tried to select, you know, those that were rich were got, got looked after and those that didn't have much money, you know, weren't let in. Mm-hmm. And so I just tried networking like that, hoping I would get a job with these bankers that were in Hong Kong. Um, I just became the man that knew where to get stuff, you know, where were the best parties, where were the best hangouts. And then people would contact me and go, you know, can you throw a party and can you do this? And, hey, I'm going to England. You're British. Do you know anyone? Yeah, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And it just grew. And I was actually trying to get a job delusionally as a stockbroker while building up this networking community and income by traveling the world, going to these places and uh, obviously, I never got a job as a stockbroker, but before I knew it, I was just uh, on the Rolodex of some pretty important people. How old were you when that started? Uh, early 20s, so like 21, 22. Were you always the person, even like in school when you were younger, that was the connector that knew how to no, throw a party and that sort no, of thing? No, no. And I still now class myself as a as um, the worst networker in the world you know if i go to a networking party and like the events that we go to you'll always find me at the corner of the bar uh just growling See, at this people. is not true <laughs> i've always envied how good of a networker you are no it's, i'm the guy at the bar yeah, behind right. the bar it's gonna be corner. me and you at the bar from now on um no i just i don't like networking events because it seems to be a challenge how many business cards you can get and as soon as they got a business card they're gone oh yeah um, yeah, yeah. If I, if I meet someone and that kind of strike me as in, interesting, I want to sit down and have a chat. So <clears throat> networking events don't really give me that ability to kind of like engage with someone. So if I go to one and I'm forced to go, mm-hmm. I'll sit in the corner and just see who I can like pin on and, you know, attack and go, you seem interesting, talk to me. And I'll do it like that. So I was never very good at that, that schmooze and that kind of, like, hey, you know, my name's Steve. I, I can't be doing that. So I don't. Uh, and I wasn't like that at school. And just standing on the door – they have to come to you. 
they come to you and they go, oh, can I come in? And as I say, if you felt that they were good people, you'd be like, yeah, go in and ask for Tina. Tell her Sim says, you know, that, that you need to be looked after. Yeah. Or if I saw a couple of planks, I'd be like, not tonight, boys, you know, move on. And I'd send them down somewhere else. It was grotty. So it was just a gut <laughs> reaction of what I had at the time. A okay, couple of planks. Already. <laughs> Lucas, interpret for me. What is a plank? <laughs> <laughs> Lucas says funny stuff like that all the time, too. He goes, he's a dude. And what's a plank? <laughs> It's not uh, someone you want to be kicking around with. Yeah. No. A blank is someone with just no brain cell, basically. No brain. That's funny. Uh, <laughs> and so then how, how do you end up from there? Where did, did you go back to England or did you come here? No, I never ever went back to England, funny enough. Um, when I was in Hong Kong, as I say, I was trying to get a job. And Hong Kong was this, this mass migration of everyone from the UK, Australia, Germany, a lot of uh, European countries as Asia was what they called the tiger market at the time. So it was this boom in expansion of, of modernism and westernized world going over there. So there was a lot of expatriates over there earning tons of money, not paying tax, wanting to spend it, wanting to keep it offshore. So I just ended up kind of getting into that crowd and throwing the events, as I say, delusionally, because I wanted that lifestyle. Um, but then I would get people like jewelry firms going, hey, look, you know, I, you know how to you know, throw these events. Can you throw this event? We're, we're selling these new watches. And I got in touch with Ferrari. And then I got in touch with the uh, NetJets and these uh, uh, Gulfstream aircraft. So before you know it, I was throwing some pretty serious parties. And then people were like, in six months' time, we want one done in Monaco. Can you do that? And I'd be like, sure, I can. And they go home and try to work out where Monaco was. Um, <laughs> so in a way, in that moment, are you scared or are you just like, hey, this will be fun? I didn't have anything to lose. Right. So that's usually what gives you fear. Yeah. Um, I had nothing to lose, and I'm young and dumb. Um, thought I was invincible. Right. Thought I was a bit of a tough lad. Um, so, you know, I had everything wrong. Um, and so someone would throw me a challenge. I'd be like, yeah, I, I can do that. And then go home. And then in maybe in the, the cold light of realization, sobered up from a couple of whiskeys, I'd be like, crap, you know, what did I promise I was going to do? But the more I did the more credible I became. And then I could walk into an area where I'd never been in before and go like, you know, you don't know who I am, but this is what I've done before. And then that cred that credibility kind of carried me along and the kind of the wilder and the more amazing stuff I did. And I'd throw a party for Ferrari. So all of a sudden I could throw a party for, for Gulfstream. And all of a sudden then the Grammys wanted to chat with me. And before you knew it, I was, I was getting into some pretty serious offices and always thinking, I'm going to be found out one of these days. You know, how the hell am I getting a, I'm getting paid to go and party with these people, you know, and, and they're going to fly me there first class. And still happens now. I was in, in Israel a couple of months ago for an event, and uh, these people knew I was in Israel. So they wanted me on TV. So I'm on Israeli TV, and then I'm on the Israeli radio stations. And it was just, just weird, the kind of places I get flown around. So it's pretty cool. So how young were you when you started to kind of develop a system for the impossible? So if somebody said, hey, we want to have Ferrari or what was the first thing that you said yes to that kind of what you were in over your head? So there's a few questions there. Um, from 94, I was the doorman trying to build up a network. And I was trying to build up a network of people I could resonate with. So without realizing it, I was building up a community and a culture. If I didn't resonate with them, I didn't care how rich you were, didn't want to know. So if somebody comes through the door and, the, and there's somebody you think might be somebody you're like, here's my number if you ever need anything, let me know, I'll take care yeah, of you. Yeah, but I always found the best marketing in the planet was to get someone else to tell someone that you were brilliant. Mm. If you did it with self-promotion. So, you know, after I started kind of looking after a few people, someone would come into me and they'd say, I hear you're the man, the man that can. I'd be like, well, possibly go and speak to Chris, you know, ask him. And I would deflect people. And even now, you know, if someone's in, in like one of the clubs that we're in, you know, I'll say, oh, you know, they go, oh, I hear you do all this stuff. Go speak to Joe. Ask him. Go speak to Dan. You yeah, know? Yeah, he'll, yeah. he'll tell you. So I'm, I'm happy to deflect. And, and, and now I, will, I always leapfrog off for someone else. So if I need to get some, like every year I work with um, Sir Elton John's foundation mm -hmm. for the uh, Oscar party. And every celebrity you can think of goes to that thing. So if I need to get to any one of those, <clears throat> I can go to that group and go, look, Make a call. Let them know that, you know, I may look strange, but I get stuff done. Right. And so I come through a source of credibility. And that's how I started, even at a young stage. So even working on the door, I would deflect you to someone else. Because when they tell you, that's gold dust. 
You know, it's funny because it, and when I was at 25K and I approached you about Journey, I don't know if you remember, but I asked you about having so. So on, Gary has a dream on his 50th birthday to have Journey play. Yeah. I do recall. I walked I over recall. and talked to That's you about right. it. Yeah. yeah. And then you, you actually said, you said, you should go talk. I forget the guy's name, but you said, you should go talk to him because he played on the stage with right. Journey and I got that done. It's funny. You deflected me right to him. To, to have a conversation with him so he could tell you tell me what was possible yeah it's the best marketing because then you, you you've come back and i'm now credible to you right so yeah. if if i had just told you yeah i can do this, it's just marketing yeah yeah and with my stunning good looks you'd have never paid me <laughs> so how did you figure that out though how did you figure out that that was important oh i didn't do you remember that woman i told you about earlier the one i married 32 years ago she did oh. so I was still doing my stuff, partying like crazy. And then what I would do is about three times a week, I would actually like take my earrings out, put a suit and tie on, and go and hang out in like the cafeterias or the, have lunch with these bankers and brokers and agents. And this was daft, praying that they would offer me a job. Now, it, it was made, made uh, clear to me a while back, it's the only time in my life I never asked for anything. Anything I need, I go out and get, I ask. I'm very happy to ask, you know. This is going to cost 20 grand. Give me 20 grand, I'll make it happen. I've got no problem with that. No sticker shock. Very cool about that. But this was the only time in my life I actually went into that environment thinking they're going to offer me a job. If I'd have gone in there and gone, hey, you got any internships going on at the bank or the brokerage firm or the jet charter company? I'd have probably got a job and that would have been disastrous for me. But it was the only time I never asked. And my wife actually said to me one day, we were living in Switzerland at the time, she actually came over to me one day and she went, look, you keep going to these things, but you throw like two parties a year, uh, through two parties a month, and this is our bank balance, and this is where we're living. Isn't it? Kind of time you started looking at what you got. Wow. And it was then that we screwed it all up. <laughs> it <was> the usual <laughs> entrepreneur, you go, hell, I've got something here. I've got to be a business. So now I've got to be sensible. Now I've got to get one of those things called a website. Now I've got to kind of like start it out. I've got to think of a really good name. And that was the funny thing. I did a podcast on this this morning about branding. We had to filter people coming into the to the clubs and my parties. I would send out where it's gonna when it's gonna be, and then on the day I would send out where it's gonna be, what time, and what's the password. Uh. Okay, so it was always a secret door kind of thing that was going on. So these people would turn up, and I always thought thought that a good filter would be to have them say something stupid. So I would say, look, the password is name two of the Teletubbies. Or, and this was a tough one. This was actually very hard. Name the, name the lion out of the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Jeez. That got so many people. And that was a, that was a cool one. Because yeah. you'd have these people come up and they'd be like, oh, I don't know. Is it Barry? You know? <laughs> and you, you knew it wasn't. And, but you'd be like, fucking stupid. Get in. You know? And you'd have a laugh. But... They were okay, but you get a dick come up and go, yeah, no, I don't know. You know, I'm here for the party. I don't think there's a party here, mate. And the whole thing behind you is kicking off. And we'd, there'd be me and this other meathead, and we'd be like, I, do you know about a party? No, I don't know about a party. And there'd be people behind them. We'd be like, sorry, mate. You know, you know, I think you're in the wrong place. And we'd just send them away. But other people would come up and go, I still don't know. Is it Terry? We'd be like, no, but go on in. And, whatever. and one of the other passwords we had... <clears throat> was finish this sentence, one fish, two fish, red fish. And that was one of the easiest ones we had. Yeah. Um, but when we decided, okay, we've got something now, um, everyone had my phone number. We sat down, me and my wife, and we tried to think up the most obnoxious, precocious name that signified the connector of all. And, of course, we were going through Greek mythology and all the, I, I don't know how many bloody syllables were in these names. And we came up with a few names. And we actually registered one of them in the uh, Virgin Isles, you know, to, to have an offshore bank account and stuff because, you know, we dealt with a lot of international clients. So we had this company. People would still phone us up and go, is that Bluefish? And we'd be like, no. And they'd go, oh, okay, and hang up. And so then after a while, we thought, we've got to call ourselves Bluefish. And it was the community, it was our culture that adopt, adopted this name. Mm. So that's when we became Bluefish. We literally closed it. I can't remember what it was. There were three of them. But we closed all those names down, did a name change for Bluefish, and we came Bluefish. And people, would, if they didn't know us, they'd be Bluefish. You know, what do you? What does it stand for? <laughs> Whatever you want it to stand for. And because it didn't mean anything, <laughs> right? We were able now to give it a meaning. Um, I suppose that's why we're here now with a book called Bluefish. In it was just one of those things that happened and created from the crowd, from the masses. 
we had some huge players in there um, that were just now creating Bluefish as a as a culture, as a mm. as a as a tribe. So they adopted it for you. They came back and said, this oh, is what we want. There was no intelligence from my side. You know, you've worked that out by now. <laughs> they, they literally gave it all of its fuel and drive. Right. And they steered it in different directions. And I was like, well, hang on a minute. You know, I've got to take it seriously. Am I a travel agent? No, I didn't know what a concierge was. The first time we ever got called a concierge was when um, uh, a friend of mine who, who you know, he owned Gulfstream Jets um, bought this little company. And I got this phone call that he'd bought this company. And I was like, oh, what do you buy? He went... It's called IMG. Oh, Jesus Christ. He said, yeah, and they own 7th on 6th, which is the New York Fashion Week, and they want you to look after some of the buyers and the talent and, and they, loads of stuff. I was like, yeah, sounds great. They did a press release announcing Bluefish as the official concierge of the New York Fashion Week. And I read that, and I was like, fucking hell's a concierge? <laughs> and that was the first time we were called a concierge. Then we became the official concierge of the Grammys and the Kentucky Derby. And we were still scratching our ass going, what the hell's a concierge? And the good thing is, no one knew. So we had all this press. People had no idea what it was we actually did. So we could, again, give it our own, uh, give it our own meaning. Now, you got, you know, we got dogs, you know. There's a vet concierge. Yeah, you take right. your Cadillac in to be serviced, there's a Cadillac concierge. Mm. So everyone's a concierge nowadays, but that's what we were called. So we didn't argue with it. Yeah, yeah, that's um, not at the level you're doing it though. You're solving, <laughs> right. you're a problem solving concierge. It's a, we get the, the good thing about being bluefish and being concierge is I get to play in any sand pit I want, yeah. and so I get a lot of people coming to me and they go, "We got this product. We need you to do. We know you do corporate events. We want you to do the product launch." And I'll be like, "Great, but I don't like your packaging. I don't like your message." So maybe we ought to look at the branding first. So then I've been able to come in as Steve D. Sims and gone, let's look at the marketing. Let's look at the voice that you're actually going. So before you get Bluefish engaged to actually do the event, why don't we actually kind of like look at who your avatar is, who your client is? Mm. So I get to play in another sandpit. So that's the beauty about my job. I get to do basically what the hell I like. <laughs> And take on the clients you want and the opportunities that you want Absolutely. to take on. Absolutely. You know, yeah. if, if you know, if someone yeah. turns up and they got a bundle of money, but they're a prick, I'm nowhere near them. Yeah. If I got gas in the tank and I got whiskey at home and the family's safe, I'm already wealthy enough. Yeah. You so back to when you're younger, how did you figure out your system for making the impossible happen? Well, they say experience always comes once you've screwed something up. So <clears throat> I screwed up a lot. That was my next question, was your failure. So I'm excited uh, to hear this one. <laughs> tons of, t- someone said to me today, you know, what are, you, what are your biggest, uh, what did you fail at? And I went, absolutely everything you can think of. Um, the website, perfect example of the website. So we were getting known to lurking around and doing all this crazy stuff. And we got asked to be on a British radio, a British TV station. So I did this British TV show. And we had just put up this website, and it was about thirty thousand bucks for like three pages. You know that, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. The usual, um, the that, normal. Yeah, but that was like. Do you remember nineteen ninety nine when it was like Linux and HTML? Oh, yeah, and you yeah, had to get yeah. this, this, this this kid to design this this thing. And it was ten grand a page kind of thing, and it was dead slow. And one picture that would would load after about four days on dial up. Um, <laughs> so we had that. We had this website, and I'm on this TV show. And this woman's there, and she said, oh, you, you travel the world, and you do this. And, I'm like, yeah, yeah. and she's going through a few of the little things that we've done. And we'd started working with the Titanic, because uh, James Cameron was uh, doing this Titanic movie and was actually doing a lot of trips down to the Titanic. So we were piggybacking by shoving you know, paid clients onto these Titanic trips. So we were getting known for doing, sending affluent people down to the Titanic. So that was a good icebreaker for us. And um, she turned around, and she said, you're so exclusive. You don't even have a phone number or any way to contact you on your website. And I sat there and I'm like, yep, we're that exclusive. <laughs> and then came off and I was like, who the fuck left our phone number off the website? <laughs> so we had absolutely no We, you couldn't email us, you couldn't mail us, you couldn't phone us. We'd spent 30 grand. <laughs> we'd spent 30 grand and no one could contact us. <laughs> So you were there, sounds though. A lot like something we would do. <laughs> yeah. So I just went through all of this stuff, and uh, I would invoice people, and I would invoice them for my cost and not for my commission. So my wife's like, "Well, how much are we making out of that?" And I went, uh, uh, um, "No, we're not on this." And so <laughs> everything I could possibly screw up, I would do. But every time something happened, 
I would try to find the lesson in it so I didn't look that big a plank. And so I'm like, well, okay, I don't do the invoicing anymore. Uh, website, yeah, I don't touch that anymore. So I would always, uh, and Joe always says this, and strategic coach always says, you know, if you could do it, get someone else. If they can do it as good as you, pay them to do it. Yeah. So I literally look for anything that I'm doing in my life. If someone else can do it just as good as me, I'm going to find someone to pay them. Oh, that that was a a fun conversation with Babs and um, Dan Sullivan, who who are the the sweetest, smartest people. But Dan was saying that he doesn't drive. Yeah, so he hasn't driven for twelve years. Or cook. Yeah, he says I decided it, I get road rage. I don't like it. It stresses me out. So I just won't drive anymore. He's a car service. Yeah, and he's and the thing that I mean, I've done it for a long time. I'll take I'll get a driver sometimes, especially here in L.A. because it's an hour to go you know, a couple of miles oh, yeah. and you can work. And so sometimes it's better, but he, that's his, that's his, um, that's his gift to himself. Or I remember I, I was talking it. about some marketing and I, I'm a great believer in the handwritten note. So I'm always writing notes and stuff like that. And I remember Joe saying to me once about, you know, you know, what do you do with the notes? I said, well, a stupid question. You know, I'd write them and then I'll post them out. And he went, so you go down to the post office and you post them. And I went, yeah. He says, uh, how long does it take you to get down? And I said, oh, 10, 15 minutes, you know, and then I'll get a sandwich on the way back. He said, so you're out a couple of hours. <laughs> I went, yeah. He said, so what's a couple of hours worth to you that you're going to go out and post them? And I thought, ah, that's a bit stupid. You know, anyone can spare, you know, a little bit of time. And then you suddenly realize you do that a few hours a day, yeah. a week or, and then you start going, hang on a minute. And even the handwritten notes, you know, some of the time, if I've got a whole bundle of them, I'll dictate one of the notes and, you know, my, my daughter write the damn things. Um, but uh, so I do try to find if, if anything can be replicated and the standard not lost, that I pay to do it. Yeah. What do you do when um, when you pay somebody to do something, but it's not the standard that you? Well, it's got to be to the standard and you try them. You know, I, I remember um, I think it was David Jensen said, uh, hire quickly, um, hire slowly, fire quickly. So anyone that comes anywhere near me. For anything that I'm going to have done, it could be mechanics on my bike, it could be, you know, writing notes, it could be website design, so I'll say, let design me a page, you know, write me a letter, do this, and if I like it, I'll talk to you. And so I, I interview absolutely everybody I do anything with, and I have them give me examples. New person wants to work for us, I'll say, right, um, I want to go to Tokyo, write me an uh, itinerary for a culinary experience in Tokyo. Uh, have you ever been to Tokyo? And they'll be like, oh, no. Well, okay, then it'll be good then. Mm -hmm. I'm there for 10 days. Write me the itinerary. And I want to see where their fails are. I want to see if they try it and do a pretty good job of how to lay it out. Even if the information is garbage and they haven't found good stuff, if it's laid out to be impossible to misunderstand, it's very easy. If it's laid out well and it's visually good, I can fix the rest. Uh, but I want to see you've got the basic basic grunt of it there and if they get to a point and they're just stuck i want to know they're going to reach out to me or they're going to just keep flapping until they drown yeah do they ask questions right or they exactly or, yeah. so if they yeah. kind of phone you up and they say, steve i want to give you the best itinerary i can but i actually see the, the other thing well it's not even stuck you know here's the dumb thing you say look i want to go on a 10-day uh, culinary experience in tokyo great all right and then they run off and you go well hang on a minute you haven't asked me if i'm taking my wife you haven't asked me if I'm taking my kids, you know? So if they go, if they go, okay, that'd be great. I'd, in order to give you the best, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. You say culinary experience. Uh, do you have any dietary restrictions? Yeah. I was gonna yeah. Say, are you I, allergic to fish? I don't eat fish, <laughs> you know? But isn't that, isn't that a perfect question to ask? Yeah. yeah. You know? So if they start asking you, you go, okay, then, you know? Yeah. That's, so you've got to go through those fundamentals. And if they don't ask you, but they, they ask everything else, you can go, well, hang on a minute. You didn't ask me if I had any dietary restrictions. Peanuts. Joking aside, peanuts are used in a lot of Asian food. You know, dietary restriction. Yeah, I blow up when I eat a peanut. Well, I'm thinking maybe China or Asia should not be the best place for you then. Right, yeah. You know, yeah. just something like that. Um, but you're looking to find out how interested they are. And it's all about asking the questions. Yeah. Huh. How many people do you have working for you? We have a team of about 50. We have a full-time team of about eight, and then we take on different people around the planet as we need them. Oh, okay. All right. So, you know, like on a contract basis? We, yeah, we've got a fantastic network. We're like in about our 23rd year. You know, when we were in, uh, we were in Rome a couple of years ago because we had a client want to get married in the Vatican. Uh, we had about 60 people on, on, on ground that worked for us there. 
and we had about three of our team just managing them and, and I was permanently I was stationed there for like about about three or four months wow. um, in Rome to get this done they wouldn't accept an email so you know they if they wanted anything I'd have to go over I'd have to take it away from one house they have houses they have the house of Augustine the house of St. Thomas and Thomas Aquinas so they have these different houses so you go to a, like Augustine you'd pick up the paperwork you weren't allowed to take it to Thomas Aquinas that day you had to take it back to your hotel even if you'd filled it out there and then you'd have to go back the following day and if you went oh can I fax it no can I get a courier involved? No. If you send us a courier, we can't be we can't guarantee we're going to receive it. So you'd have to you'd have to be stationed there just in case you got a phone call to actually pick up a document and take it back the following day. Jeez. And they don't have emails. This whole thing was done. No emails were allowed to be done. It was a very weird environment, but but kind of cool. You know, I got to hang out. Uh, I got to hang out the back of the Vatican and just like nose around areas you don't get to see. So it was pretty cool, yeah, and that's no. that's the fun of my job. I get to I get to be in I get to be in rooms that I shouldn't be in. Right, right. So that's the fun, and I get paid for it. How so much traveling do you still do? Do you still do a lot of traveling? So I said to my wife, I think it was about six years ago. I said, you know, I'm traveling too much, and um. I'm still gold on gold and diamond on absolutely every airline you can think of. <laughs> so um, this year I've done um, Europe a couple of times, done a lot over America, but you know, just you know, the usual kind of stuff in New York and Miami, San Francisco stuff. But the big stuff, uh, Japan and um, Japan and Israel. Oh, and Germany a couple of times. Oh, okay. So okay. I think I'm not traveling, but you know, we're in. We're in September, and that's that's today. And I know I've got a lot more to do in New York, and then I'm back in Asia again this year. I think. Oh, jeez. So, what have you learned about in wealthy people and their expectations of things? I know, like one of my friends, it's very wealthy. I always call it rich guy problems, but they get mad about the simplest. The the details. Yeah. How do you manage the details when you're doing such elaborate things for them? Uh, I always underpromise. Uh, that's that's so the frame up front. Uh, so whatever I do, I kind of like manage the expectations and I manage them low. You know, so if they're going to get if they're going to get ten pieces of cake, I'm going to promise them seven. Um, I always do that. I believe that there's a, a credibility bank that, that that's kind of like being registered in the head. So you know, if you promise them twenty things, but like something's a bit short, but actually you know they're getting thirty. Then if one thing fails a little bit short, then you're okay because you've made it up because last night you gave them this or you did this or they were expecting that room in a hotel. They were not expecting the, the suite just under the presidential or, you know, they weren't expecting to be picked up in a Rolls Royce to be taken to the, you know, Central Pay Hotel. So you're building up that credibility all the time. So you're surprising them with things that they didn't know you were going to get. You'll promise them uh, a transfer and give them a Rolls Royce. Probably the biggest one, was um, I had a client and his stipulation to me, and this is a common thing within Bluefish, the longer we have the client, the shorter the request becomes. So when you get your first client, they come up to you and they're like, oh, I'm a mad fan of this and I want to do this and I want to go over there and I want to make this sure this and I want balloons and I want an elephant. Like they, journey for your birthday. Journey, like, yeah, like you. And so, <clears throat> but I want to play drums and I want to blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So they give you all the details. They give you the whole damn itinerary. And then you go, that sounds fantastic. Why do you want to do that? And then you start asking them questions. And then you find out that the balloons got nothing to do with it. You know, they just thought balloons would make it good. And so, you know, and then it's deeper. And so things evolve. So you actually want to ask them why, why, why a couple of times to actually get to the nuts of what it's all about. And then as you've worked with them a few times, they kind of like, well, I'm not going to tell him. I'm just going to go, I need to go to Spain. Uh, or I'm, I need to do this, or I need to do this. And I had this one client contact me, and he went, I need to go to Florence for dinner. I'm taking my girlfriend for dinner. It's her birthday. I want to go somewhere exclusive. That was it. All right. Dietary restrictions. Anyone else going to be joining you? Yeah. Actually, her best friend and probably her mum. It's going to be six of us. So I want an exclusive restaurant in Florence. All right. I'll make it happen. Now, if anyone's ever been to Tuscany, they know that it's family style. The whole point is you walk into a restaurant in Florence. Have you been to Florence? No. Uh-uh. Right. no. You walk to Florence. If you walk to New York and you want a table of two, what are you going to get? Table, table for, for two. two. Yeah. Bingo. You go to Florence, you want a table of two. You're going to get stuck on a table that there's 22 people and there's two seats 
and you're now on a family table and you're like passing each other the bread. Before you've left that meal, you know everyone's relative and um, illnesses and, and happiness. You've just gained 20 new members to your family. That's the whole point of Tuscany. And your meal lasts about eight days. So <laughs> this guy wanted an exclusive restaurant. So I knew what he wanted, but it didn't exactly exist in Florence. Didn't mean that he shouldn't get it. We knew what he wanted. We just now had to create it. So he's a very private gentleman. So we knew that it couldn't be with people. And, you know, you could walk and buy out a restaurant, but how bloody boring would that be? You're in a restaurant and no one else is around? Yeah, it's quiet. Yeah. yeah that'd be yeah, terrible. It's, it's like Applebee's at four o'clock in the afternoon. Right. You, know, you, just, <laughs> you just don't want that. <clears throat> so we tried finding something that would give him another part of a story. So we tried to find a location, started just dreaming. Where's the ultimate location? So Florence, you know, Diamo. Diamo is this massive cathedral. It's absolutely beautiful. It's all made out of marble. So beautiful that they didn't want to ruin it by putting handles on anything. Okay. Bottom line of it is, do you guys know what the Diamo is? Would no. you recognize it if you saw a picture? Maybe not. The Palazzo de Vecchio. It's another massive icon of Florence, which I'm sure if I showed you a picture, you'd go, eh, no, whatever. But you may not know what it what it looks like. And from the inside, it's very ornate. But again, you may not recognize it. In Florence is a museum called the Academia. In the Academia is one of Michelangelo's only statues outside of Rome. David. There's no one that doesn't recognize David. It's sure. more famous than the Statue of Liberty. So we thought, how cool would it be? Kick everyone out of the museum. Set up a table for six at the feet of the most iconic statue ever done. That's a story, okay? And it sure is shit exclusive. Well, that is. And then we thought, well, you're in a museum. So we went through the whole thing. And, you know, I actually got the Vatican to phone up and find, you know, let them know who I was. So I was doing my leapfrogging of credibility. And uh, they agreed to this. And we had this table set up. And we thought, it's quiet in a museum. <laughs> you know, we've got to get some entertainment in there. So we asked around, and we got this, uh, we got this uh, quartet, the string quartet. Yeah, that's nice. That's, that's nice. Bluefish doesn't do nice. How can we do something that's a little bit cooler? And we started, again, just dreaming. And you, you dream big. You know, you go for, the, go for the moon, you get some stuff, that kind of stuff. I'm amazed at how many people don't even reach. So we thought, well, you know, what's, who's the most iconic Italian singer? Okay, that's not dead, you know? So we had a couple of in our group went, oh, Pavarotti. Yeah, well, yeah, he's not busy anymore, but, you know, he's not going to come along. He's been dead for many years. Um, we had to point it out to him. And then uh, we thought, Andrea Bocelli. Okay, he's Italian. People know him. I wonder if he'd like to come along and sing for a dinner party, you know? So phone up the Vatican. Do you know Andre Bocelli? Yes, we do. You couldn't make a phone call for me, could you? Suddenly so made a phone call and the clients came in. I've got to give you this funny thing. On the front of the academia, I want you to picture this. Two of the biggest bloody doors you've ever seen. These wooden doors with the big brass rivets in them. Typical Italian. And there's these plaques. There's about 15 or 18 plaques in all these different languages. And these, these doors are open up. And my people are walking through these tables, these candelabras, and these hot plates for the chefs to start doing this food. And the museum's there. And I said to the museum, you know, just passing the day and keeping the conversation going. I went, I see all these plaques. You know, what, what do these plaques mean? And I thought it was announcing who's inside, you know, what artists are actually showing inside. And this lady looked at it, and she went, um, all the plaques, they say the exact same thing. I said, what is it? No food and drink inside the museum. <laughs> In every language? <laughs> every language. And we're piling <laughs> candelabras and tables and everything. <laughs> so that cracked us up. And so we got, the, uh, we got the table. It was all set up. It was absolutely stunning. One of the most impactful things that I've ever done. And the client was, and this is like four o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, we'd all, we knew Andre Bocelli was coming over. So the clients weren't showing up until nine o'clock. So I had about three hours chatting with Andrea Bocelli uh, for this for this serenade that he was going to do. So I said to him, I said, look, you know, I'm actually setting up the clients. They don't know you're coming. And he said, they do not know. And I went, nope. It's a surprise. 
So this is a great surprise. Oh, it is. So the clients turn up, they're sitting down, the string quartet goes off. So I enter the room. Now the clients obviously knew who I was, but they didn't know I was on site. So, you know, sometimes I'll just be hidden, you know, and, but I went out there and I was like, you know, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, you know, what are you sorry for? I said, I had a local entertainer that was going to come in and sing for you during dinner, uh, with the quartet. And we had a piano in there as well. And uh, I said, but they couldn't make it. So I'm going to quickly run down the road and see if there's anyone in one of the local bars that I think is good. And I'll be back. <laughs> and that kind, a, of, that kind of... Yeah, Talk about they, a frame. That's a great frame. Too. They kind of looked at me a bit funny. I'm like, yeah, don't worry. Don't worry. It'll be okay. And they're kind of like, oh, okay, Steve. And you could see they were nervous. So then I walk out one of the side doors. I give her a couple of minutes just to kind of like settle in there, stick my head out. And I'm like, it's all right. I got someone I'm back in a minute. And then, you know, meanwhile, Andre has stood there listening to all of this with Veronica, <laughs> his wife. And we're just out of sight. And I go back out and I went, you ready? So I look at the string quartet. They obviously knew he was there. Give him the nod. They start playing. And I walk out with Andre Bocelli on my arm. And my clients were like, oh, you know. It was just, it was brilliant. So it's all to do with positioning and setup. Man. So when you've got the client that's being a bit demanding, just exceed what he's actually going to get, but you don't tell him. If the guy thinks he's getting a red cake, you know, tell him it's a little red cake and then give him a three, three piece wedding cake, you know, in red with balloons going off of it. So just exceed the expectations, but never tell him what they're getting. Yeah. Is the, the part of coming up with those ideas, the fun part for you? Yeah, it's usually like, you know, it usually starts with, I've got an old fashioned in my hand and I came up with this idea. So, um, alcohol has been the, uh, has been the, <laughs> the fuel for most of my daft things. But, uh, now, yeah. See, it makes more sense that people would just tell them, hey, I want to go to Florence. Oh, right? yeah. Because yeah. if you say, I want to go to Florence and I want to eat at this restaurant or whatever, you might be, um, you might be dumbing down your experience. Right. Yeah. 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 And we got that credibility now. And of course, we get the different, we get the different medias and we get the different articles and we get the different TV and stuff and they reveal all these kind of things. So people, people do come over now and just go blank sheet. I need this. Yeah. Okay. What's, what's your budget? Budget's X. And uh, we go, okay, fine. Yeah. We could do something in there. So what's the average like budget for a trip to Italy? You know, do you want to be going in the Vatican at midnight? You know, or do you want to be going in with a coach no at nine o'clock in the morning? So it's uh, it really depends on, on how far you want to take it. So you could go and have a fantastic trip uh, with a family. Uh, I mean, two people in, in Rome, decent hotels, you know, for like 10 grand. You have really good, you know, have, have some great restaurants, some great access and stuff like that. But you're not shaking hands with the Pope. Um, so, you know, if you want to go that far, then, you know, you're starting to hit quarter of a million bucks. Uh, so it really depends on how far you want to take it. And the, the good thing is most people that come to us, they have no idea. They go, oh, I'd like to do something. Well, you know, do you want to meet the Pope? Can I? Well, I don't know. Do you want to? You know, and just, <laughs> yeah, you just got to, yeah, you just, just got to find out if they, if they have the desire and that's the key, the desire, you know? If you hit someone with a price tag and go, well, that's going to cost 20 grand. Because let's be honest, no one wants to spend 20 grand. Yeah. You know, because um, 20 grand is 20 grand. Right. But hang on a minute. If you get to do this, 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 you're not spending 20 grand anymore. You're doing this, 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 this. You know, the experience has overtaken the dollar sign. So yeah. I never speak to people about, about the money. You know, I'm always kind of like, well, okay, what do you want to do while you're there? Mm. Have you thought this through? Can you afford it? Well, I don't know how much it's going to cost. Do you? I have no idea. I'm just talking to you at the moment. But if you can get those hot buttons, they'll sell their firstborn. Yeah. <laughs> right. So. Well, yeah, some people to meet the Pope, there's no, there probably isn't a dollar amount. Oh, hell no. And everyone's, everyone, some of the stuff that I've done in some of the arenas and industries, I have absolutely no care for. But it's been such a thing for them that I've gone, you know, this, this is something incredible. There's a story. You know, you mentioned the guy from Journey. Incredible story. Did you get the whole story of that? I think you told me most of it, yeah. So this, this guy, and it all goes well, you know, he met Richard Branson, told Richard Branson he had this dream. He wanted to meet Journey. Richard spoke to Joe Polish. Joe Polish phoned me up, said, you know, see if the guy's real. 
So um, I phoned him up and he went, oh, I want to do this. And I went, great, send me 10 grand. And that was it. And uh, this is all documented. You can see videos on this. And he took a gamble and he sent me 10 grand. So I thought, well, okay, he's serious now. Now I'll have a chat with him. So I chat with him. So the 10 grand is just the entry fee. I just wanted to find out if he'd send me 10 grand. You know, I wanted to find out if it was big enough to him. You know, obviously doing something like something with a major rock band ain't going to be cheap. But if you're going to go, well, I, I don't know. I, I just think that's a lot of money. I'm not sure. That would have been a very short conversation. So he went, oh, okay. I went, great. You know, I'll, I'll email you my details. And I did. And he paid. I went, all right. It's important to him. I didn't even cash it. He sent me a check and I just wanted to chat with him first. So then I got chatting with him and I said, you know, what do you want to do? And he went, I want to meet him. All right. Okay. So, you know, we'll get you to meet him. Why do you want to do that? And I knew there was something deeper. So then he starts to reveal this story about how when he was at college, he was sleeping on his mate's couch and he was the lead singer of a Journey cover band. And he wanted to just basically meet the guys that had got him through the hard times. And all of the music meant different parts, different chapters of him growing up. And <laughs> there's a big key element here in, in a moment. So he goes through this story and I'm like, there's some depth there. There's some substance. This isn't, I woke up one morning, I want to jam with Lady Gaga. This is someone that's been in your life quite simply longer than his girlfriend's. You know, this is someone who's been there for him. The music sent him forward. And he was like, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, we got to do something here. So um, I said to him, so shaking hands with him backstage that's gonna do it the story you've just given me that that's that's gonna be the, the, the climax that's gonna be the end of the movie right off into the sunset shook hands thanks very much bye fuck off it's like well, um no no i don't think so so what are we gonna do maybe jam with them you know do they, do they you know are they rehearse and stuff maybe we could i could go along and you know see them when they're jamming and stuff like that you don't want to go and see someone when they're working if i'm working i sure shit don't want you to come and say hello to me because i'm working you know, afterwards I'll have a beer with you, but if, if someone's in the recording studio, they're in that moment. You know, don't mess with that. So, you know, we, we got chatting and we go, um, yeah, there was obviously some, some depth there he could afford. It. He had some stories, blah, blah, blah. So um, I approached the band and I said, look, there's something going on here. You know, I've got to tell you about this, this story. And I introduced them to this stuff and that. And uh, anyway, they ended up agreeing to have him come on stage as the shortest term lead singer of Journey, and he actually sang four tunes live on stage at what was called the Cricket Amphitheater at the time in San Diego. All the, all the pyrotechnics, the lasers, the whole freaking works. But here's the thing. So we get there that afternoon, and we're backstage and watching all the setup and all this kind of stuff, and he's pacing up and down. He's freaking nervous. I'm not, obviously. <laughs> I'm not the one performing. You don't have to perform, yeah. No, no, I've got an iPod. Your and job's living. pretty much done at that point, right? Yeah, I'm there just for the, for the shits and giggles. And so we're backstage, and I'm watching this whole thing go on. And again, I'm in another room that, you know, I shouldn't be in, and I'm looking around, and I see this guy wheel on what can only be thought of as, like, Houdini's suitcase. It was this massive suitcase, and he clicks it and opens it up. And as he opens it up, it's just lined up of all the guitars. And I'm like, holy crap, that looks cool. And no one's around. So I thought, well, when am I going to get this chance again? So I wander over to this thing, looking at all these guitars, you know, ding, 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 touching these guitars. I'm on stage, pull a guitar out. <laughs> okay. So I've got this guitar in my hand, and I'm like, ding. Ding, 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 ding. I couldn't do anything with it. The thing's not plugged in. So this guy comes over and he's like, excuse me, do you mind? I'm like, I'm sorry. He takes his guitar out of my hand and puts it back in. I'm sorry, fella. My name's Steve Sims. You know, we're doing this thing. You know, we've got Danny. He's going to be in there. We've got a charity involved. I'm sorry. I just, I couldn't resist. I just, he's like, hey, I've heard it's happening. I said, look, you know, I'm sorry. I, I didn't want to you know, mess around with anything. Ah, it's all right. It's all right. I said, oh, Good, good, cheers. I said, hey, you know, I know this sounds funny, but I'm British. And, uh, you know, I don't really know who Journey is. So if you can do me a favor, and literally the day before, we downloaded that greatest hits. I never Google clients. 
So I didn't want to Google, you know, this kind of thing either because I didn't want it to, to potentially frighten me, you know? I wanted to go about it ignorantly and get it, get it done. So we downloaded the album the day before their greatest hits. So we recognized some of their, their hits by now, but I didn't know the band. So I said, look, do me a favor, you know, I'm over there. He's pacing up and down. I think he's going to go through the stage any second now. I'm going to get over there. But when they come on, you just do me a favor. You know, you know just like stick your finger on. Just let me know that they're walking on. I appreciate that. Sure, man. No worries. I went, thank you very much. So I started to walk off. I went, we're here. He was the lead guitarist of Journey. So, so I was like, oh, no. And he was like, oh. And so Dan looks over and I went, Dan, come over here. So Dan came over and then I introduced those two and the, the guy started like signing everything that Dan, Dan had on him. So it was, it was pretty cool. But that was my embarrassing moment with That's Journey. Funny. <laughs> so you, you said something in there, though, is that you don't Google him because you don't want it to cloud your... Your mind? Mm -hmm. Yeah, whenever, like, um, we still don't have phone numbers on our website, but you have to apply to be a member. And even if you get referred to be a member, you have to fill in this form. So we get that form, and then we arrange a time to chat with you, and we interview you to find out if it's a fit. You know, is Bluefish actually right for you or not? Um, but we never Google them, because we don't want to get you up on a pedestal. We don't want you to be harder to reach because of what we've read. We don't want to find out that you are the head of a battalion or you own a country like England, you know. We don't want any of that for us to be like, oh, my God, you know, I don't, I don't want to say anything that pisses them off. So, you know, we just schedule a time to chat. Uh, we try to do it by Skype if we can. Uh, and then we get on and we go, hey, how you doing? What do you know about Bluefish? Why did you take the time? And we interviewed them. And then afterwards, we, we, we Google them and suddenly find out that they do actually own England or something, you know. So, in fact, I've got a, I've got a funny one, if you don't mind me telling you this, this story. So, I had this client that became a member. And uh, don't worry, I'm not going to mention your name because he, he's going to know who he is when I mention this. So, um, he, uh, he joins up membership and we did this interview on this uh, skype and he was a cool guy and when we got on skype he had a black t-shirt on so i went oh you got the dress code you know we, we're good so far and we had a little bit of a joke and there was a bit of a banter going on and he went look you know i'd like to be a member and i went fine great you, you seem like a cool cat you know be a and he's from the middle east and i said you know we're gonna send you uh, the uh, form fill in the form send it back you in so he sets it up so then uh he get, I get an email and from one of my team that he's contacted out, and every, every member gets a dedicated host. So I appointed the appropriate host for his character. So she contacts me, and she says, he wants to meet you. I said, oh, really? I said, is he coming over to LA or something? You know? And she says, uh, yeah. I said, oh, when's he coming over? When you're available. So he's going to fly over. He just wants to meet you. All right, fine, fair enough. And so I contacted him. I went, look. We've Skyped, you know, that's the peak of my interest in two years. You know, I'm, it's I'm very a, intimate, the yeah, Skype. I'm a, how much closer could we get? <laughs> yeah, I'm really like I'm over it. I'm this really, is how millennials communicate. Yeah, I'm, I'm an anti-climax, buddy. So, you know, if you're going to, you know, if you're trying to rack up your air miles or something, then maybe, but, you know. So he's like, no, no, I want to come over. Like, okay, fine, fair enough. So, so he arranged to come over and I said, look, where are you staying? He went, oh, don't worry about it. I said, look, we have a travel department and now you're a member. So, you know, you may as well, you know, use it. You know, we're well known for having a certain standard of clientele. So in which case we get good rates or we get up. Don't worry about it. You're the member, but, you know, you're missing out on one of your perks. Don't worry about it. All right. So I couldn't be any more forceful. So I said, you know, where are you staying? He said, I'm at the Four Seasons in Doheny. I'm like, oh, okay, fine, fair enough. You know, we'll meet up for breakfast. So I go down there and I've got a, um, I collect motorcycles. So I've got a whole bunch of motorcycles. And this time I'm, I'm putting some, some miles on a Harley Davidson I got. Typical Sons of Anarchy job, you know, granny scare, a loud pipes, all the stuff. It's the one I rode here for today. So um, I pull up out front the, uh, the Four Seasons. Guy looks at me, obviously wishing that, you know, I wasn't there. And I said, hey, you know, where can I stick here? And usually they go, oh, you know, downstairs or, you know, around the corner or anywhere else other than here. You know, those are the three responses. And uh, he said, who are you here to see? And I said, who I was. And uh, he you know, kind of speaks into his little lapel. Manager comes shooting out and sticks cones around the bike and says, leave it there. <laughs> I'm, really? That's he nice. went, leave it there. And this is smack in the entrance. No one could drive in, you know, and my bike's now coned <laughs> at the beginning of this day. <laughs> now you're that guy. At the four seasons. <laughs> I'm that annoying person, yeah. yeah. So the manager walks me through to the breakfast area. And like all hotels... There's a big restaurant, and for breakfast, they usually rope off half of the, the restaurant, don't they? 
So there's all the kind of like the booths and all the couches all in the back and everyone's got like this part of the of the restaurant. So he goes through, lifts up the velvet rope, takes me through, and I'm now in this booth. So everyone in the four seasons kind of looking over going, the bloody hell's that? I am sat there, me, my jacket, crash helmet now on the table, thinking, why am I over here? This guy comes through. They open up the rope for him and he comes through and he's got his black t-shirt and jeans on. We shook hands, chat and stuff like that. We're chatting away. And I went, uh, so you're staying here? And he went, yeah. I said, well, they obviously know you. He went, yeah, they, they do. I said, well, looking after me, well, they stuck the bike out front to shove these cones on. He said, oh, they're good, good. They look after you. And I said, well, you should have told me you were staying here because the Four Seasons is one of Bluefish's partner programs, uh, partner hotels, and we get special perks. He went, I get a good deal here. I said, we get great deals. Why won't you use this? He went, I own this. <laughs> <laughs> and that was why he stayed there. <laughs> You're like, yeah, never mind. <laughs> ah, so, well, in that case, you're paying for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think is the difference between people that perform at a high level and people that are comfortable being average and let me let me throw one out there and then get your opinion F- fear of failure i think is the transparency um and i hate it because everyone's out there at the moment going oh he's so authentic authenticity is everything um that's just the latest kind of like you know t-shirt slogan but I but think- there's something to that right no i hate that word I really do despise that word. No, pass the word, though, to the real thing. But I think you get to that word by being transparent. See, I think a reason why I think you're such a, you're so good at working the room is because you're so authentic and people are attracted to you. Yeah. I would say it was, I was easy to understand and impossible to misunderstand. Yeah. So I get those people to come over to me and they can see through me. They know exactly who I am. They know exactly what I'm about. Um, and I think, I think I'm obvious. Um, and, and don't you think people are attracted to that? I think they are at ease with that. Um, and I'm not sure. But in a were... room full of sharks. Bingo. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> when you're in a room, and it's always funny because you, you go into these events, and I try not to go to them, but I end up in these rooms, and it could be maybe the release of a new hotel. You know, and it's the opening night of the hotel. And you've got to be there because, hey, you're going to be doing loads of work with them and stuff. But then there's all the local, you know, middle management that want to try and get in there. And, you know, so you've got the guys in there that are trying to be something. by you know, That are looking to, past you and looking around. and They're trying to look sharp. You've got the girls in there trying to get the big hitters. And then halfway through the night, those two hook up with each other. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that he couldn't afford the drinks he's, he's drunk tonight. And you just think you've hooked a whale. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the corner with a guy and we're drinking beer. And he happens to be the guy that funded this Ritz Colton, you know? Right. So it is very funny. But I think where we've been successful and where I've been successful, and I, you were talking about failures earlier, there was a time when I tried to be somebody I wasn't. And I failed. And luckily, I realized I was failing. And I went, this ain't me. You know, and I would, yeah. I would wear smart suits. And hey, I like going to the, the Oscar. Elton John's Oscar party is the only party I go to guaranteed every year, year in, year eight, year out. Because it's a cool ass party. Okay, I really enjoy that one. I love show, shoving on the old kind of like penguin suit and having a bit of fun. And the wife gets to stick on a few, you know, bangles and diamonds. And that's fun. Okay, but most of the time, this is as good as you're going to get. Black t-shirt and jeans. If I want to be smart, maybe I'll put a jacket on. You know, but that's that's about it. But I think I'm easy to understand, and therefore I'm not threatening. And when you go into those kind of rooms and you're looking around, when you've got someone that isn't comfortable and can be the coolest cat in the planet, but isn't comfortable in that room, he's giving off a vibe, and no one wants to work with someone where they're not sure some things wrong here there's yeah. i'm getting a read here and it could just be that he's nervous in that room and they will walk past that person me i got nothing to lose and i said that to you before i got nothing to lose i'm here i was invited here if i don't talk to anyone i go home my mortgage is still paid i'm still drinking whiskey and i'm lose in this argument so i can just sit at the bar order drinks chill talk to anyone i want to Ignore anyone I want to, 
I, I, I win either way. You talked about that when I was at the the meeting with you. You were saying they were talking about like uh, I can't remember what the topic was that Joe brought up, but you were mentioning that the you went away from that authenticity and you started wearing the suits and driving the fancy car and <sighs> kind of had this this persona that you felt like you had to have mm. because you became more successful and the your tribe kind of pulled away from you. Yeah, and you you felt it and you noticed it and you said, okay, well, I gotta I gotta just be who I am and went back. I thought I I was. It's funny because it that sits with me today. It was a it was a um, it was a great story and it makes a lot of sense. You know, it was a it was a picture that I still have in my in my office, and um, I was working. I'd worked for a jewelers. The jewelers were releasing a new line, and they contacted me to do some of their launch parties and get the right kind of clientele in, which is fun, good, open-minded entrepreneur people with big checkbooks. Right. And it just happened to be my target market because I can relate to them because they know what kind of like hustling for the next dollar is, and they know what it is. So all of my clients are, are self-made, and I've done very well in those kind of areas. No matter who you know that is successful – they still know what the pain is like when you're going through a grocery store adding up how much you're putting in your car versus how much you've got in your wallet. Right. That feeling never goes away, you know? And so you should be blessed and happy that you're not counting, I don't know how much a bloody loaf of bread is now, but, you know, I never look away from the fact that I do remember those days when I had to calculate it going around. Um, and I was working for these jewelry companies, and this jewelry company got involved in Ferrari, and then I was working with Ferrari. I'm still a guy on a motorbike, but now I'm working with the most luxury car company in the planet, going over to Maranello for meetings. I'm still thinking I'm going to get told to stop, and one day just get arrested for having too much fun. And I had, uh, I had the chance um, of getting this Dino, this 72 Dino, Ferrari Dino. And I was like, that's classic. You know, you either, nice you either Ferrari, you either drive Ferrari or you are a Ferrari aficionado. And this was in the aficionado range. So, okay, this is good. I'm getting an old car. Right. So I got this old Ferrari Dino and it was an absolute beautiful car. I loved it. And I went to a party in Monaco and uh, we were at a place called Villa d'Este and uh, at the Saint Jean Cap Ferrat just on just off of uh, Monaco. And we had this yacht for this party. And this yacht was this three-story, shiny, mirrored, mega yacht. And it was great. And everyone was on it. It was like big. Well, Arnold Schwarzenegger was on there. Uh, the head of Gulfstream Aircraft was on there. The heads of countries were on there. Um, you know, just the, the place was just rocking. That boat, most definitely at that moment in time, especially during the Monaco Grand Prix, was the richest per square inch out of any way. We had the biggest jewelry firms, the biggest private the jet ownership. They didn't do charters. You bought jets. These were clients on there, and, and friends and family of Ferrari were on this boat. So, And I'm throwing the party. <laughs> so I get off this, this, this boat, and uh, my Dino was there, and I was getting a lift back because I was already wankered by them. So I wasn't going to be driving this this Dino back. So the Dino's there, and uh, someone was going to take a picture of me with this Dino, and I got this suit on, and I'm feeling pretty, yeah, I'm the man, I'm here, I've arrived, and I've got this Dino, and I look over to my right, and there's a yacht, and it was a classic sail yacht. And I thought to myself, that's nice, and it was bigger. It was longer. It wasn't taller. This one was three stories, but it was bigger. And I was like, oh, that's a bigger yacht. So I got in my Dino and I reversed it. So it's at, at the, whatever they call the front, the bow or whatever it's called, um, the front of this boat. You know, I'm very knowledgeable with boats, as you can tell. Sure. So I'm at the front <laughs> of this boat. And I get out of the car and I'm leaning against it and I took this picture. And this was in 1997, the 50th anniversary of Ferrari. Okay. Anyone who was anyone was at, Monaco for this event and then I got a lift home then the following day went back and I got in the Ferrari and uh, the both boats had gone by then and I took my Ferrari back to the hotel and then eventually went back to Switzerland and this was in the days when you had these camera rolls 
and you take it out, you stick it in one of those prepackaged uh, envelopes, you send it off, and about three and a half years later, you get the photographs <laughs> back. Right. It's not like digital now, is it? But you know, you get these back, and you can like, whoa, and you can't remember what the bloody roll was you sent off. And uh, I think it was about four or six weeks I got it back. And my wife came in, and we were in the office, and she throws this down on my desk, and I opened it up, and it was all the Monaco pictures. Oh, yeah, look at this. I'm, I was with Prince Albert in one of the pictures. I was with uh, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. So this was like a name-dropping you know, bucket of pictures. And then I get this picture of me outside this, outside the Dino, outside this, this yacht. And it just suddenly hit me. That yacht was my party, but I felt so inadequate. I actually had to have my picture taken outside of someone else's freaking yacht that I had nothing to do with. This had the richest people in the planet, but even then I was still searching. I wasn't comfortable with who I was. I was wearing a suit, and it was an Armani suit. Armani suits, you know, I know it sounds funny, but they're very sloppy suits, okay, especially in the 90s. You know, this was the days where you pulled your sleeves up. Right. Being a biggish fella, if you don't wear something tailored, for bigger, you look chubby, and I look, I look terrible. And I'm outside this car, trying to grasp at this iconic car, trying to. It was so. I got drunk and never left that office, and it was so gut wrenching that I was so weak as a person. I had done that, and today I still have that picture in my office, and it still sits there, not because I'm proud of the picture, but because of what it symbolised. And I look at it and I go, that ain't happening again. Huh. And I came back to Geneva and uh, I'd been in Geneva, I think maybe 24 hours and I put the car up for sale and um, threw the suit out and I went, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing that again. You know, that, this, is, this is not happening. So I got rid of everything um, and just decided that I'm, I'm going to be me. And if you don't like it, then move on. Find someone you do. I, I'm not offended. You know, I don't resonate with you. That's fine. And if you like what I do, but we don't fit. Hey, I will introduce you to someone that will laugh at your stupid jokes and will put up with you. (laughs) I Uh, need need that. You can do whatever you like, (laughs) but I'm I'm not going to be someone I'm not. So that was, there are people that, that nobody would laugh at their jokes. (laughs) Come on, Steve. (laughs) You can find somebody to laugh at the person who's joking. Yeah. Yeah. You have to hire them. But that was, that was quite, money can do anything. That was quite a tough one for me. I love that. Is it Dan Sullivan saying about there's, there's no problem that big if you can write a check. Yeah. 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 If you can write a check, you don't have a problem. Yep. Yeah, it's good. That's good. That's fun. Want to talk a little bit about the book? Well, first we should tell him that we should have got him to get Arnold. Oh yeah, I was gonna. Oh yeah, when he Ooh. said Arnold, it just it hit me. Oh, we messed that up pretty yeah. good too. So I we, don't know why we didn't think of that. I don't know either. I don't know either. So we we had a big event in August. We have an annual event. Yeah. All right. And so we had this idea. We're like, let's just get a huge speaker, and then we're gonna sell tickets. It's gonna be a huge event. And this is like this is I don't know ten months out. Yeah. And so we were thinking like either Gene Simmons was kind of rolling around and then we ended up on Arnold. It'd be great to have Arnold here. He would resonate with our audience, be perfect. So we found his uh, agent, we contacted them and um, set up a deal and and made an offer to him. And then we had this, uh, he's a member of the Havana Club down here where Chris is a member too. Right. So we said, okay, well, let's figure out what his favorite cigars are. So we found a cigar supplier, bought two boxes of his favorite cigars, I told his agent, you know, this is what we wanted to give him. And then I, uh, we went on, I went on Twitter and I hit him on, uh, Twitter and Instagram, I think, sent him pictures of the cigar box and said, Hey, look, you know, we want to, you know, we want to have you at our event. Really excited. We got you these great cigars. Now tell him the number. His number was he wanted 300. Yeah. 300,000 to speak. We offered him 150. Yeah. Okay. It's an, it's like, you know, and he lives, he lives in Santa Santa Monica. Monica, The event was here. Oh, yeah. So you just got to drive down the street. Yeah, yeah. So we figured for 150 grand and some cigars. Yeah. So anyway, they said he had so the date open. He, you know, we just didn't hear. Didn't we hear, waited for thinking, five months. Thinking, yeah. We kind of blew our chance at getting a big star for our event because we ran out of time. Yeah. And then he just said no. And he said no. All right. So then we were. When the, was this last year? Uh, that was this, this year. This year. This year. This year. He's been. He's been hot and cold. Um. 
for a few few years now, ever since he was getting pre-set up for The Apprentice. Um, you know, th- there were times when you could get a meet and greet like 50, 50 60 grand, you know, for, for some time. And then all of a sudden, you know, oh, he's going to be a contestant on here or he's going to be on here or now he's doing this. Um, and the rates then suddenly go up and then there's movies coming up. So it just, it depends on the temperature when you're getting someone. You know, you, you mentioned about Gene Simmons. Mm-hmm. And no, taking nothing away from, from Arnold whatsoever, but you should have stuck with Gene. Gene's a businessman but, and a half. Yeah, we went all in on Arnold, and then we we lost our chance. Then it was too, you know, yeah, you can't yeah. get people on two months' notice. Well, well the other Gene's thing, too, was cool. marketing it, for us. Like, yeah, yeah, we had yeah, to, yeah, like, yeah, we had to use it to make the money back. Well, that, yeah. that, and that, and his, okay, so again, that's down to that position. We're coming thing. to you for, for next Just year. Time, bro. <laughs> if, we if, screwed that up. If yeah. you know, if the, if the celebrity knows, and that's the worst thing, you know, as soon as they know that they're the talent and they're the celebrity, but more importantly, as soon as they know that they're the hook, that's when you've got extra digits. So oh, yeah. if they know the only reason that people are going to your event is for them, then whoa. So it's a case of we've got this event. We wish for you to be part of it. We wish you to be included within some incredible people. And then you can dilute the number. Right. And so that's how. So basically don't <clears throat> have them as a calling card, but just don't make it so blatant that they are, they are the main reason people are coming. Right. And that's where that it starts to get choppy. Sense, yeah. yeah, no, I've never, I've never paid rack rate on a, on talent in my life. No. Never, never have. People come out here. Well, they're busy at the moment. That'll be four hundred thousand dollars. That's fantastic. I'll give you seventy five. <laughs> you know, it's Tuesday. You're in town. I'm asking you to turn up, talk, drink, and go. Is yeah. it better to let them say the number first? Because we went at him with the number. Because that's kind of how his agent set it up. She's in New York. And then she was like, "Well, make an offer." He gets. They always do. Yeah, they they always want. We you to thought there's no way he'd say no for 150 to drive. Yeah, 20 minutes down the freeway. Yeah, if you know. Okay, so here's the bottom line: if you know your numbers are 150, you offer 75. And here's another thing: you offer 75 to his charity. Okay? Oh, there you go. Always yeah. offer it to the charity first. Okay. Now, depending on the person you're talking to as well, because agents they don't get any money if it goes to their charity. So the and I'm giving you some, I'm giving you some stellar stuff here now. All right, always go. Don't go to the agents. Agents are, and I know I'm in Hollywood, and I know a lot of agents here, but they're all assholes. Okay, <laughs> that's the bottom line. They were born to be assholes. They're agents. Yeah. Right. Okay. There is a course. They're in the position. That's the yeah. Position. There's a course they that have agents to say go no. on to be assholes. Right. Okay. But here's the thing: they're there to go. What's my fifteen percent? Okay. They want you doing all the donkey work. And then they want to go to someone else and go, well, we know that you wanted him then, but we've also just got an offer this morning for $150,000. So if you're not coming in at two hundred, dollars then, you know, we've got another. They, just, they will just play you off against other people. So what you want to do is if you want, if you want Arnold, and I'm going to be loud and clear here, go to charities he supports and go, we want him to do this. And this is, this is with anybody. Just go go to the charity that they support and say, we would like to have this person here. Journey, Autism Speaks. The drummer's son has autism. We wow. went through Autism Speaks. Wow. Okay? They charge a million dollars for, for a show. My number wasn't there. Right. You know, same with Andre Bocelli. Cancer Foundation. <laughs> so always go so through funny, the charities. Yeah. That's funny. And you know the other thing that happens? When you're making that payment for 75 grand or 100 grand or now 150 grand to that charity, okay, it's tax deductible. Yeah. Because you just made a donation. You haven't hired anyone. You've made a donation. You made a charitable donation. God, I'm smart, man. You are. I'm like, uh, man, we, I'm just like, <laughs> we thought of a lot of things and we didn't come up with that one. We need, <laughs> Always we're go gonna, through the charity. We're going to enlist your help next time. Oh, there you go. That's funny. Man, crazy. So what I'm are we chatting about now? I think we're wrapping it up. Rapid. But we will. Um, I'm excited to read read your book, "The Art of Making Things Happen." Yeah. And you definitely have a a gift of that. Well, I wanted to do something that actually, you know, because everyone can look at look at the stuff I've got and go, "I can't do that." I can't. And the bottom line of it is, they always say, "If you say you can't, you can't." Right. Um, but what I've done is, I've I've told the story of what I've done, 
And then I've cracked it down into the little cheat sheet bits. And at the back of every chapter, there's a cheat sheet of like the, the five, six, ten, three things that I've actually done that you can use in your in your florist store or you can that. use in, in kind of like doing a kiddie's birthday party. It's all broken down. So stop looking at the fact that it's the Vatican and just look at it as the fact that it's just a venue huh. and just how to break it down. Yeah, it's funny. It's just like a checklist of executables, right? You just have to go and I have to execute on this. Well, and then... I've, I've done the book and I don't, want it, I don't want anyone to buy the book, which is probably the stupidest thing in the world to say, okay? I want them to action it. So if you think you're going to read this, be smarter and then wake up one morning richer, you ain't, huh. okay? It's like one of those fat sods that buy diet books. So what I want is I want you to buy the book and action it. I actually want you to do some of the stuff in there so that it will actually make an impact and it will make a difference. Because if you're just buying it to be smarter, and anyone that's listened to this knows that ain't going to happen when you've read the book. Sure. What uh, When's the release date? 17th of October. Okay, so coming up here. Yep, it's very, very And then it's on Audible course. at the same time? It is, it is. It's on It's on the, all the usual uh, suspects, you know, Barnes & Noble, it's on uh, Downpour, it's on uh, Amazon, everything else you can think of, Google, Kindle, okay. the whole works. It's across the board. Simon Schuster have been a very surprising and active and wonderful partner in this. Um, and uh, I didn't even Google them. When I got the deal with them, I went, uh, I actually told Jay Abraham, I went, I've got this deal with some company called Simon Schuster. And he went, Simon Schuster, I went, Schuster, Schuster, I don't know what they're called. <laughs> and he went, you better look them up. And I looked them up and I was like, oh, okay, they're, they're quite, they're quite sizable. So yes, that's, that's quite nice. So I, I do have a, a mammoth in my, uh, in my pocket there with those boys. And they've really, actually, there's no boys in it. They're all the ladies, some wonderful ladies up in New York. And uh, yeah, they've done it. They've done a great job. Are you going to go on a big book tour? Uh, no. No? Um, no, I'm actually, and you guys are welcome to this. Um, I'm having, uh, I've noticed people have these signing, uh, these book oh, yeah, books, sign, these yeah. signing. So I thought I should do it and I should do it in sim style. So I've taken over a whiskey bar and on the night before the launch, I'm just inviting a whole bunch of people and we're just going to get slammed on whiskey and that's going to be the excuse for the launch party. There you go. And my wife said, so how's that going to benefit the book? And I said, no, it probably won't. <laughs> but we're all just going to get drunk and some really cool people are just going to get drunk on whiskey. <laughs> And so um, I'll send you the details, but it's on the 16th of October, the night before. So I will probably have no idea what's going on the 17th, <laughs> but uh, it will be a good party. Awesome. No, that's fun. Well, no, thank you for coming down. This was it's, fun uh, and we learned a lot and we're going to have to help us. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. I think I'm a member of Bluefish, right? You are. You're part of the Genius Network, Joe yeah. Posh. Yeah, yeah. So Joe's is the only group that we have complimentary membership with. The only group in the planet. So uh, Joe, Joe used all of his, um, you know, Darth Vader eyes on me to to handle that deal. <laughs> Joe. He was like, "You will give it to my members." It's like, okay, that's fun. Joe's Good. crafty. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Steve.